Good morning. Today is the seventh. Yes, today is the seventh. <sighs> Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord inputteth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. A daily reflection on the Old Testament. Psalm 32, 2. We seldom use the word input, impute, in modern conversation, but it is a significant theological term. To impute is to credit, to put on an account. When Jesus suffered in Gethsemane and on Golgotha for the sins of all humankind, in a way that is incomprehensible to us, the burden and weight of the sins of humanity were imputed, inputted imp to our Lord. That is, it was as though Jesus had become the great sinner, as though he had inherited the world's curse. Conversely, through coming unto Christ by faith and repentance, his righteousness is imputed, inputted onto us. That is, it is as though we possessed the full righteousness and perfection of our Lord and Master. Jesus was not guilty of sin, but sin was inputted to him. We are not as righteous as Jesus, but through his perfect atonement and our repentance, his righteousness may be inputted to us. Imputed? I, I don't know. Thank God for the great exchange. It's one of those very simple words, but if you don't pronounce it right, like, anyways, okay. So today is 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 23 through 44. And yesterday we left off with the woman's child dying and her wanting to go and see Elisha. So she goes, she sees Elisha and um, she falls down at his feet and says, didn't I ask you not to deceive me? Did I beg you for a child? And yet here he is dead. And um, Elisha says, okay, I'm going to send my servant. He's going to go and put my staff on your kid's face. And the servant did that. But the woman was like, I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving you. Uh, and so Elisha goes with her. And the servant went before them. But he didn't wake up the child. So um, Elisha comes in and he lays down upon the child he covers him completely face to face hands to hands he covers the child and um what did it say it said that he sneezed seven times and then his eyes were open and he started walking about the house after that there's a drought in the land and elisha makes cottage for priest. That part I was a little confused about. Granted, I skimmed over it because the boys were in here making noise. But anyways, that's the gist of it. And as you know, there's nothing in here and there's nothing in the Ludlow. So I've got nothing really to say. Uh, I suppose what can we learn from these verses? How can we apply it to our lives? And what I would say is... Don't leave the prophet. She she wanted something so badly, so deeply that she refused to leave his side until she got it. And I suppose that is the lesson. Stick to the Lord. Never leave his side. If there's something you want so badly, don't leave him until you get it. All right, and now I will leave you with a prayer from a diary of prayer. Today is July 7th. It doesn't say who it's from, but... <sighs> o Lord Christ, lifted 
on the cross that you may draw all men unto you. Have mercy upon us. It is our self-love that crucified you then and crucifies you now in every thought that turns in upon self, passing you by in every word and deed that pierces and thrusts for self, wounding you in your, in your children, longing for you we yet stand far off upon the hill of Calvary, mourning for what we are, afraid of the darkness we have brought about us by what we do, clinging still to the secret sweetness of self-love and unable to bring it to the love that burns for us upon the cross that it may die there in the flame. Lord, strengthen our weak longing for you with the great strength of your longing for us and bring us through the darkness to where you are. Give us courage for the dying, courage for the grave, courage for the newborn, love created after the pattern of your own. In our dying, Lord, in our resurrection, you will be close to us. We shall no longer be far off. All right, that was Second Kings chapter 4, verses 23 through 44. Respectively, it's well. We do chapter five. See you then.